The song I'm going to sing is called Key. It talks about how the precious blood of Jesus cleanses us. Precious blood has left me forgiven. Pure like the whitest of snow. Powerful to make sin and shame retreat. This covenant is making me whole. So I will. That was the training he got at Kerry. A 
And after he got the training, he still had his faith needing to be developed. There were still things in his life that need to be gotten rid of. So God sent him to another school, a graduate program, the school of Zarifa. Zarifa means a smelting furnace, a crucible where you melt alloys, a place where you refine metals. And so God sent him to Zarifa to have him purified in the home. The home is the context of one of the greatest training grounds for your faith. When you are sitting by the brook of Kerit, you are all by yourself praying with God. You are such a holy angel. But watch when you sit amongst other people. Then you discover. So the married life is a good training program and you don't have to be married. Your roommate, your colleagues at work, even the church is a family where God trains our character. Elijah, there, he had to learn to depend on the Lord day by day. And then he learned lessons of you know, contentment with little. He learned lessons of gentleness and provocation. He learned lessons of persistent intent. In, in intercession prayer. Elijah learned so many things, and at the close of that encounter, the woman gave her gave him the certificate. Now I know that you are a man of God. That is what qualified Elijah to stand for now coming. He was now a man of God, and God could use him. <laughs> Today we are going to follow Elijah. As he went on our account. Fascinating account. It's a long chapter, First Kings chapter 18. The message will be based on the entire 46 verses. So I can only give you tidbits. But I'm sure the Holy Spirit will speak to us. Before we get into the word, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Speak to our hearts clearly. For we ask. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. See, three and a half years have passed since Elijah stood in the court of Ahab and Jezebel announcing to them there will be no rain in the land. During those three and a half years, Elijah spent part of the time by the brook little stream called Kerr. And then the other part of the time, he spent in the home at Zarifa. While he was in Zarifa, calamity had befallen the entire nation. For three and a half years, there had been no rain in the land. And so the land itself had been parched as if it had been burned with fire. The scorching heat of the sun had destroyed all vegetation. Streams that were never known to have dried up were all dried up. Bleating sheep and cows wandered hither and thither looking for food, looking for water. Lands that were once flourishing had now become deserts. The groves, the bushes, which were once dedicated to Baal worship, had become leafless, and the air itself was suffocating. You've got to live in the Sahara part of the world to understand how it feels like without rain. Dust storms blinded the human eyes. Cities that were used to being prosperous had become places of weeping and mourning. Hunger and thirst abounded, resulting in thousands dying. It was during this time that the king and the queen, King Ahab and Jezebel, put a finger on who they considered to be the cause of their woes, Elijah. So they put Elijah on the wanted list. And his name was flashed on the television screens in those days. There weren't none. But if it, today, the name, this man is a terrorist. 
he must be arrested, whoever finds him. The curse of the, the, the bear of Hashemesh were upon him, he be cursed. The security and military intelligence of Ahab were sent all over the place scouting, looking for Elijah. In fact, in our time, we'll say they unleashed the FBI, the CIA, the British, you know, Scotland, and the Interpol, the Mossad. I mean, everyone, this international network of security people, they were all hunting for Elijah. Meanwhile, where was Elijah? He was hiding in the hometown of Jezebel. If Elijah lived in America about this time, where there's homeland security, his name was into all the security system at the airport, everywhere. He was wanted. It was at this time of danger that God sent a message to Elijah. Let's take a Bible. First Kings chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of God, the word of the Lord, came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Notice, the word of the Lord came to him. That word had come to him before. The word of the Lord came to him when he was in his hometown. Go and confront Ahab and Jezebel. The word of the Lord came to him after that. Go and hide at Kerry. The word of the Lord after the brick dried up. Go to Zarephath. And now, that word of the Lord comes to him again. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. As long as he was obedient to the word of the Lord, he was saved. Any time he didn't hear the word of the Lord, he was in trouble. And tomorrow you are going to see one of the reasons for Elijah's failure. There was no word of the Lord. And he took matters in his own hand and was fleeing. But here, the word of the Lord came to him. And this time, the word of the Lord said, Elijah, go and show yourself to Ahab, and I will send down rain. But notice, while Elijah, the school says, so Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria, the capital of Israel. While Elijah was headed towards Samaria, another dynamic was taking place. This time, from Ahab's perspective, he had commissioned some people to go and look for food. If you read verse 3, Ahab had called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. And the Bible says, now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Ahab said, over there, I want you to go and look for food. We are studying. Our animals are dying. Go and look for food. It is very puzzling that we find in the home of Ahab and Jezebel a God-fearing man. When all other God-fearing men are being killed, but now in the whole, there's a God fearing man. In fact, if you read the account further in verse 12, the very last part, you know, even Obadiah himself confessed, I have feared the Lord from my youth. This man was a godly man. And somehow he could live in the home of Ahab and Jezebel. It's puzzling. On the positive side, God can keep his faithful even in the home of the enemy. And we know that, you know, he took food from Ahab's table, Jezebel's table, and secretly fed God's faithful people who are hidden in a cave. He was a good man. But there's something troubling about this man. How could Ahab and Jezebel tolerate him? Did they know that he was a God-fearing man? It seems to me the more you study the account, Though Obadiah was a good man, a godly man, he didn't show his true colors. You are going to discover it. And often that's what happens. Good people, secretly, doing good things in great places for the cause of God. But they don't have the courage to take a stand. Because if they do, Ahab and Jezebel will attack them. And so, 
Ahab and Jezebel now commissions this godly man to go and look for food. Look at this story. Ahab had said to Obadiah, go into all the land, to all the springs of water, to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses and mules alive so that we will, have, will not have to kill any of our livestock. Israel was wounded. The famine had devastated the land. Men and women were dying. The land was sick because of sin. It needed grace to heal it. And Ahab was searching for food, sending people to look for food. But what kind of food? If you read verse 5, he sent Obadiah to look for grass to feed his horses and his mules. Searching for grass instead of grace. That is what happens today. When you are not fully alive with God, the Ahabs and Jezebels of this world would use you to search for grass instead of grace. That same selfishness of Ahab is alive. When his nation was dying and he ought to have led them to seek the grace of healing, he was only thinking selfishly about his cows, his horses, his mules, searching for grass. And that selfishness is rampant in our church as well and in many lands. We are selfishly using the resources God has placed in our hands for our horses and mules, for the luxuries of cars and homes. The selfishness of Ahab and Jezebel is alive. We spend our resources on clothing, on shoes, on all kinds of things instead of seeking the righteousness of Christ. Chasing grass instead of grace. <coughs> we are building, spending lots of money on our fancy buildings, our houses, and yet we cannot find a house for God's church. So one of the parodies is here in this great city, Geneva. We don't even have our own worship place. We've been here for about 20 years. Something is wrong with us. And yet, most of us are building our own homes. Grass instead of grace. We spend lots of hours on the phone, on email, chats, rooms, etc., talking with our friends. No time for the Lord in prayer, in devotion, searching for grass instead of grace. We spend hours reading all kinds of things, books, memos, etc., etc. How much time do we spend on the book, the Bible? Grass instead of grace. I don't know about this place. In our churches, whenever it is time for communion service, we are nowhere to be found. But we'll be at potluck, you know, restaurants, eating all kinds. But when the Lord sets a table before us in the communion service, we are scared. Grass. Of grace. There are many applications on this, and uh, I can go on. And even in our homes, parents, mothers, what kind of food do we serve our children? In many cases, it's grass instead of grace. We don't feed our families well. And then the wife tells us many are going to die, and on their graves will be written, die because of poor cooking. Die because of bad food. Grass instead of grace. Are you reading the Bible? Spirit of prophecy? It, it applies to our ministers. What kind of food are they serving our church members? Increasingly, the ministers are not preaching the word. They will tell all kinds of stories. Fancy theologies, philosophy, opinions. But no Word of God. Grass instead of grace. Students and teachers who are in schools read all kinds of books in the libraries, trying to get an education, but the book of books that disciplines the character and transforms us into men and women that God can count on, we don't seek that kind of education. Grass instead of grace. The church 
is repeating the same of Ahab and Jezebel. At a time when the nation was wounded, it needed healing. We are more interested in selfishness. It's of that which our people truly need. Now, when you read from verse 7 onwards, there is an interesting dynamics between the character of Obadiah and Elijah. I've already mentioned to you that it is very startling to find a godly man living in the house of Eli, in the house of Ahab. And Ahab didn't seem to be troubled at all. And yet when Ahab met Elijah, the first thing, you are the troubler of Israel. Why did he say that to Obadiah? Could it be? That Obadiah hid himself. We do know he was a good man. The Bible makes it clear. Verse 3 says, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. That's the last part of verse 3. And then the last part of verse 12, Obadiah himself confessed, I am your servant. I feared the Lord from my youth. He was a good man. But the more you study the account, you are going to discover he was a good man who lacked courage. The Bible tells us when Obadiah met Elijah, he recognized him. Verse 7 says, Now, as Obadiah was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him and he recognized him. So he knew Elijah. But somehow, when Elijah told him, Obadiah, go and tell your master Ahab that I want to meet him, he said, No, I cannot go. I'm afraid. Ahab will kill me. You, in fact, three times in the account, you, oh, Obadiah kept complaining, Ahab will kill me. If you read verse 9, the latter part, he said, you know, Ahab would kill me. You read verse 12, right towards the end, Ahab would kill me. If you read verse 14, Ahab would kill me. This man was afraid. He lacked courage. He knew that Ahab was ruthless. And Ahab said, when you meet Elijah, bring him here. I cannot go empty-handed, saying, I met Elijah and I, I wouldn't bring him. You kill me. This man was afraid. He lacked courage. He didn't believe that God had power to protect him when he did Elijah's bidding. So we have a picture of a God-fearing man who seeks to please God and at the same time please man. How could God-fearing man live faithfully in a household except in secret? He kept his faith quiet, private. Yes, God used him to rescue many prophets, hid them, provided food for them. He was a good man, but the times in which he lived required Elijah's not good over days. Our times demand courageous people, not just good people. Obadiah represents all God's children, godly, faithful, but who cannot take a stand for right? They are afraid to speak boldly and stand boldly. They know the right thing to do. Perhaps secretly, they are trying to do the right thing, but they never want to show their true colors. They don't want to take a stand for fear. They would lose their position. They would lose their jobs or their relationship. They want to please God, but also please man. But in actuality, they please neither. The only person they serve is themselves, their self-interest and their survival. God finds such people reprehensible, for they are neither hot nor cold. They are vacillating, they are compromising. No wonder such people are forced by Ahab and Jezebel to search for grass instead of food. The Bible says you cannot please God and man at the same time. And unfortunately, we have some good Obadiahs when what we need is good Elijahs. An Adventist young lady who marries a person outside the faith is compromising. An Adventist businessman who goes into partnership with a corrupt and ethical person will be forced to do the bidding of you. 
You can't accept and serve two masses and remain pure. A Christian who cannot speak out against sin, whether it's alcohol, drugs, immorality, homosexuality, divorce, remarriage, will end up condoning those sins. The church elder or pastor who admits worldliness in the church would end up having the church becoming worldly. A Christian institution that allows its faculty and staff to undermine the fundamental biblical teachings would end up destroying the lives of the students under their care. Listen, the safest course is to take a firm and decisive stand for truth no matter the cost. Amen? That why tells us to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. You cannot please two masters. God cannot use men and women who are afraid to take a stand for the right because it is right. God calls on men who would not be bought or sold. Men whose consciences are true and honest. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Obadiah was a vacillating, compromising Christian. A good man, yes, but not the kind of man God needed at that particular time. God wants Elijahs, not just some good Obadiahs. And in the church today, there are many Obadiahs, good people, but they can't take a stand. In the biblical account in 1 Kings 18, we are told Elijah said, to Obadiah, go, tell Ahab to meet me. But Obadiah was afraid. Elijah knew that the only way he could call Obadiah out of his divided loyalty, his divided affection, and his divided mind was to give him one last opportunity to take a stand. So, Obadiah can fool Ahab, but he couldn't fool Elijah. Elijah knew him so well. So you read in the seven. Now, as Obadiah was in his way, suddenly Elijah met him and he recognized him, fell on his face and said, Is that you, my Lord? That's what Obadiah told Elijah. Is that you, my Lord? And listen to the reply of Elijah, verse 8. He answered him, It is I, go tell your Lord. You don't get the dynamics. Obadiah was telling me, My Lord, Elijah, no, 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 no. I, I don't like this kind of flattery. Your real Lord. Is Ahab. <clears throat> Go tell your Lord that Elijah is here. He must. No, he'll kill me. He'll kill me. He can't find me. He'll kill me. He'll kill me. He'll kill me. Elijah had to make one final appeal to Obadiah so Obadiah can take his stand. And so he makes an appeal, his last appeal, as it were. Just so Obadiah's problem is this. If he goes to meet Ahab without Elijah coming alone, he will be dead. Because Ahab said, they should bring Elijah along. And Elijah said, go, tell him Elijah is here, he should meet him. So, but yeah, he couldn't handle it. So, Elijah had to give a chance for him to take a stand. So you read in verse 15. Then Elijah, you know, verse 14, you know, Obadiah was coming, he'll kill me, he'll kill me. Verse 15, then Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. Have you noticed that phrase? The Lord lives. He stands by. That was the secret of Elijah. Jehovah liveth. He stands by me. And so, Obadiah, this is the truth. And I give you my word. I will turn and appear before Ahab. You don't have to be afraid that I will not show up. Because Obadiah was afraid. Assuming I go, and then the Holy Spirit takes you somewhere, I am stuck. And he said, no, 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 no. Jehovah liveth. He stands by me. I will show myself. He wanted Obadiah to get the secret of his Elijah's faith. Jehovah liveth. He stands by me. It's a long dialogue, but thank God, Obadiah finally made up his mind. He took a stand. He was no longer afraid, and he went and met Ahab and Jezebel. Suddenly, finding grass seized 
to be his first priority. Rather, pleasing the Lord. Praise God that Obadiah can change. There are too many of Badeas in the church. You can't do anything with them. Secretly good people, but they will never take a stand. Quietly they'll be doing and no, 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 no. But thank God they can be transformed. Yes. And so Obadiah now goes, he tells Ahab, Elijah is here, he wants to meet you. If you read from verse 17, I'll rush through and wrap up shortly. Then it happened, the 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, all troubler of Israel? The first time Ahab sees Elijah, are you that troubler of Israel? Troublemaker. See, it is very interesting. Anytime people who sin, anytime evildoers meet good people, they always brand them troublemakers. We blame others for the consequences of our actions. He ought to have known that the problem in Israel was caused by him, Ahab, when he married Jezebel and brought Baal worship. But now he blames somebody. I can see Ahab behaving like a typical American. Blaming everyone but themselves for their actions. By the way, I'm an American too. I just happened to have dual citizenship. But when you live in America for long, it becomes so annoying. We would never accept responsibility for our actions. Even when the, the snow comes, it comes from America, it comes from Canada. We blame Canada for snow. <laughs> but that mindset is pervading in the church. We are all blaming people for our things. Husband and wife, when they fight, they blame their spouses. Children blame their parents. Parents blame their children. Teachers blame the students. Students blame teachers. Pastors blame spenders. Members blame pastors. And it has reached a stage. Everyone is giving excuse. We are all victims. And it has reached a stage that if you can't blame anyone, then you blame God. If you can't blame God, blame Satan. If you can't blame God or Satan, blame your genes. My genes made me do it. There's a philosophical current behind it. It's a pagan philosophy. And Ahab was way ahead of our times when he gave excuses for his action. And so Elijah responded, verse 18, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you've forsaken the commandment of God. So Elijah put a finger. You've not followed the Lord, but you followed me. The, your reason you are suffering, you are going through this, you brought it on yourself. We need ministers, we need parents who can point out surgically the problems we face are often our own making. Quit the excuses. Anyway, verse 18, I haven't troubled Israel. You brought sin upon yourself. Now there is no sin in the land. We call anything but sin, it's a mistake, it's a little something. No one wants to accept the father, we've broken the law of God. Elijah was not a troubler of Israel. And today we employ all kinds of terms to brand people who point out sin. They are troublemakers, they are controversial, they are radical, they are fundamentalists, they are divisive. We use all of these instead of acknowledging that we did it. Friends, when men begin to speak well of you, question whether the praises are the praises of Ahab and of Adeus. In my country, there's a saying that it is fruitful mango trees that have stones thrown at them. When you are being attacked, you must be doing something right. When you see little boys and girls school throwing stones at mango trees, it means there's right mango there. If no one is throwing stones at you, you are doing nothing. Or to use the analogy of football, the one with the ball is the one who is attacked. When you are playing soccer, football, and you don't carry the one, one attacks you. So get used to being attacked. Get used to it. It is real. The Newton's law of 
uh, uh, motion, the third law says, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Where there is motion, there is friction. Get used to being attacked and quit this Obadiah syndrome. You want to be nice. Anyway, you read the account, verse 19. Elijah issues a command to Ahab. I'm just rushing through. Go, tell Ahab. I want to meet him on Mount Carmel with 450 of his priests, 400 uh, uh, of your prophets. I want to meet them. And Elijah issued a, you know, Ahab, who was the mother, suddenly has to obey Elijah. It's almost like Elijah was the mother and Ahab was now the seller. So he quickly, Ahab quickly rushes. He's now going to grab all his, he wants to meet Elijah on Mount Carmel because he knew the destiny of the nation dependent on him. From verse 20 to verse 40, it describes what happened when the two finally met. I want you to picture it in your mind. Perhaps it is very early in the morning. We are standing on the highest peak of Israel, Mount Carmel. And as we stand there, we see waves of people ascending the side of the mountains. Brandish on their foreheads are the symbols of the sun god. They are worshipped, clad in their beautiful garments, the 450 priests of Baal. Then there is another entourage, perhaps in a different color, that also branded on their forehead the symbols of Baal, sun worship, also climbing. And then we see an entourage of King Ahab and his political uh, leaders, all coming. It seems like a huge rally is about to take place. Only one person is conspicuous. Number one, Jezebel was not part of it. And as they ascend, they all take their place on Mount Carmel. One man was absent, Elijah. Because when you read verse 21, the Bible says, and Elijah came to all the people. Which means, while they were doing all of this, Elijah was somewhere. From the time he confronted Ahab, go, we don't know where he went. But ultimately, when all the people were assembled, then Elijah came to them. One man against a nation. With deep penetrating eyes, I can see Elijah take a look at all of them. He looks at Ahab. And he looks at the 450 priests of Dave, the 400 prophets. He looks at the people because all the people were also there. Then he turns around, looks at the vegetation that have been reduced to skeleton. He sees the devastation. Something is swelling in him. He takes a deep look. And the people, the place was silent. Everyone was silent. Somehow they alternated between fear and apprehension. Fear and hate. They affected this man upon whom had been blamed the uh, situation. And yet they dare not touch him. Because they knew their destiny depended on him. There is silence. There is utter harshness and stillness in the air. If Satan and his hosts had their way, they would have grabbed Elijah and tore him apart. But heavenly angels were also there to protect him. And God himself, who lives and sits on the throne, was also standing there to protect Elijah. The place was hushed, quiet, anxiety. What was going to happen? There will not be rain unless there is a first repentance. And so before Elijah could pray for the rains to come, he had a message for them that would call them to take a stand, to make a decision. So in verse 21 we read, Elijah came to all the people and said, How long hold ye between two opinions? If it is the Lord God, follow him. If it is they, follow him. But the people answered not a word. And Elijah continued, he said to the people, I alone, I am the one who is left, the prophet of the Lord. But those prophets are 450 men. Therefore, he gives them a proposal. If you read from verse 23 onwards, he said, listen, here's a proposal. I want you to take a bullock, big cow, whatever. Then build an altar. Don't put fire on it. Dress the bull, put it on that altar, don't light any fire, and call upon your God, Baal. And if he answers by fire, your God is the true God and will serve him. Because Baal 
was known as the sun god, the god of fire. So if there was anything he could do, fire could easily come from him. And Elijah said, I also, I will do the same. I will kill a bullock, build a altar, place it on him. I would also call upon my God. And then the prince, the God who answers by fire, let that be that God. And all of the people, if you read the account, they said, it is well. Verse 24, the very last part. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. It is fair, good proposal. So Elijah said, okay, you start. So they killed the bullock, built an altar, placed the altar on the altar, the bullock. And then the Bible says, okay, verse 26, they took the bull which was given them, they prepared it, called on the name of Baal from morning till evening, saying, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they lit upon the altar which made it. So it was known. And Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's meditating or he's busy, or he's on a journey. Perhaps he's sleeping and you must be awakened. So they cried out and cut themselves as their castle with knives and lances until blood gushed out of them. They did not hear them. I can almost picture what is happening almost like the religions of today. You go to some of these senseless places, a lot of noise, misguided, senseless, rolling on the ground, screaming, all in the name of Jesus. They worship these guys. But they couldn't answer, and he cannot answer. And he might just start mocking them. Perhaps we are not shouting, them. shout out anymore, and this dumb stupid, they worship them. He didn't cry out more. Hey, your God, perhaps he's on the telephone. He, he's not here. He cry out more. And he cried out more. Perhaps he's chatting on WhatsApp. Cry out more. And, he, and then finally they start stabbing themselves, blood, all over. And by this time, their voices were hoarse. There was no voice, verse 29, no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Baal has no answer. Make no mistake, Baal has power. But in the presence of God Almighty, his power is limited. And the angels make sure they cut them in check. The study. Then Elijah said, all the people come near to me. So all the people came near to him. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken. <laughs> See, before the rain could come, Elijah must first repair the broken down altars. The sin of Israel lay in the fact that they have broken down the altars of God. If you want power in your life, in your marriage life, your business life, whatever, you must repair the broken down altars. Family worship, prayer, devotional life. You need to repair that before the fire of God's blessing can come upon you. So he decided to repair the altars that had been broken by Ahab and Jezebel. He took 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, one representing each of them. He brought them together and built an altar in the name of the God of Israel. Verse 32, with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two shears of seed, and he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood. Then he filled four water pots of barrels with water, poured it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. So they literally drenched the animal, the wood, everything with water, with 12 barrels of water. See, we are accustomed to try to help God out by making things easier for you. Like I said, no, no, I said the God who is an impossibility specialist. I am going to convince you that God can do far greater. This thing you couldn't do, in my case, I will drench it with water. And I'm going to call upon my God. And if you read on, verse 36. Let me read for 35. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. Verse 36. It came to pass about the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Then Elijah the prophet came here and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and I've done all these things at your word. Hear me, Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Simple prayer. 
direct simple prayer. There was no shouting, no unintelligible ecstatic utterances as we find in some of these bizarre places of worship. It was a simple prayer. And the Lord heard his prayer. What makes us think the only way you can pray for God to hear you is to start speaking all these jargons, unintelligible, ecstatic utterances. That was the church I used to attend where they mumble all kinds of things. <laughs> But it was a simple prayer. And what happened? Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust. It licked up the water. That was it. I mean, it's amazing. The fire came from heaven, literally licked it, 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 you know, burned the animal sacrifice, the wood, then even the stones and the water, even the dust in the air. Set up ladies. <coughs> and verse 39, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Basically, they finally decided that we are going to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. Not they. Once they made that decision, Elijah immediately issues a decree because based on the laws of Moses, whenever people go and worship idols, etc., they have violated the terms of the covenant, they must be executed. So he issues a, 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 a command in verse 40, arrest all the 450 priests of Baal, the 400 prophets of Baal, arrest them, and so they arrested and sent them to the brook Kishon in the valley there, and they were all killed. Sin has been exterminated. The land has been cleared. The people are now ready. For God to do his own thing. And with that, the rain would come. And so the latter part of the chapter from this 41. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there is sound of abundance of rain. The rains will now come. Look at the third too. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of the Carmel. Then he bowed down to the ground, put his face in. Pay close attention. There, is, there are always two reactions after any revival. One group, like Elijah, goes up to eat and drink, business as usual. Elijah went up to pray. So the question is, this week we have this revival week. There would be two decisions, two groups which will emerge, whether you like it. One group will go up to eat and drink and watch TV and do whatever they do. Another group be so much on fire. They will be praying, they will be steady, they will be testing the Lord one day at a time. Elijah, together with his servants, they went up to pray while the king went up to eat. And while they were praying, <coughs> Elijah sent his servant, go, look at the eastern sky, you know, by the Mediterranean, and tell me what you see. And the servant comes back. He says, there's 43 thought, but there is nothing. There was no sign of rain. And seven times he said, Go again, you go again. He comes back, there is nothing. Then the son of God, he came to pass the seventh time, he said, There is a cloud, as small as a man's hand. It is rising out of the sea. Elijah said, Go up, say to it, prepare, the rains are coming. Verse 45, it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind. And there was a heavy rain. So he had put away. Some of you are sitting here today and are praying for God to send down the rain. Now can be nothing. But don't give up praying. Keep praying. Very soon God will give you a sign. A sign, a little sign, cloud, a little man. Keep praying. And before long, there will be a huge outpour. The rain escaped. And Elijah raced ahead of King Ahab. Ahab was in his chariot. Elijah was ahead of him, racing ahead as they rushed to Jezreel, the entrance. That's how the chapter ends. Tomorrow we'll continue the account. But here's the thing. Mount Carmel was a test of loyalty. It was an invitation for people to take a stand. Take a stand, Obadiah's good people who are not courageous. Take a stand. Ahab and Jezebel, take a stand. The people of God, take a stand. If ever there was a time when people needed to take a stand, 
it is now. We serve the God, Jehovah. He lives, He stands with us, and He expects us to do the right thing. No need for compromises. Now is the time. Now is the time. I pray that if you've been compromising at your workplace, in your marriage, in your relationship, in whatever, you'll take a step. Because God will not send his rain. He will not send his fire unless there's true repentance. May the Lord help each one of us. Amen? Amen. Amen.